Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be breaking down a brand new study published literally just days ago, which looks at something really important in muscle research. And that is whether different ways of measuring muscle size actually give us different results. So if you've ever read a research paper or followed a training study, then you've probably seen terms like muscle thickness or muscle cross-sectional area thrown around. But have you ever wondered if they're interchangeable or if they impact how you should interpret a study? Muscle thickness is usually measured with ultrasound and reflects the distance from an outer to inner boundary of a muscle, typically from the superficial fat to muscle interface down to the muscle bone interface. Cross-sectional area, on the other hand, represents the total surface area of a muscle at a specific slice or depth. Both are commonly used to track changes in muscle size, but here's the question. If one study reports a 10% increase in muscle thickness to a specific training intervention, and another study employs a modified version of that training intervention and observes a 20% increase in muscle, as measured by CSA, can we really say one result is better than the other? On the surface, one study seems to have observed 10% more growth than the other. Now, in my opinion, there is much more nuance to interpreting muscle growth than simply comparing relative percentage changes across different measuring techniques. And that's exactly what this new study I'll be reviewing today set out to answer. Published in 2025 in Clinical Physiology and Functional Imaging, Buckner and colleagues weren't just looking at whether muscle thickness and CSA increase after training. They wanted to understand how changes in muscle size compare between two methods and whether ab absolute versus relative changes are interpreted the same across techniques. To test this, the researchers used a really clever design. They had participants complete a single bout of resistance exercise, enough to induce acute muscle swelling. The goal wasn't to study long-term hypertrophy, but to create a quick measurable change in muscle size so that they could evaluate how the two different measurement techniques respond to the same biological event. So let's take a look at the methods. What did they do? Well, the study involved 34 healthy adults, including both men and women with a mixture of training backgrounds. Everyone came in for a single lab visit, and before doing any exercise, the researchers measured muscle thickness and cross-sectional area of the rectus femoris, which is a muscle of the quadricep in both legs. The dominant leg performed the exercise while the non-dominant leg served as a control. And this setup allowed the researchers to account for measurement error and better isolate changes due to exercise. Both muscle thickness and CSA were measured using B-mode ultrasound. Muscle thickness was assessed using a straight line distance from the superficial fascia to the bone, while CSA was calculated by tracing around the muscle's perimeter. Importantly, both measures were taken from the same images at the same anatomical site, providing an opportunity to directly compare the two techniques under identical conditions. After baseline scans, participants performed a one rep max test on a leg extension machine to determine the exercise load. They then completed five sets of knee extensions to failure at around 70% of their one rep max, with two minutes of rest between sets, with all sets performed unilaterally on the dominant leg. Immediately after the final set, the researchers re-scanned both legs to assess changes in muscle thickness and CSA. They focused on two key questions. The first was how much did muscle thickness and CSA change from baseline to after the workout? And number two, how do absolute and relative changes compare between these two measurement techniques? So let's dive in and take a look at the results. After the workout, both muscle thickness and CSA increased, but not in the same way. Muscle thickness increased by 0.4 of a centimeter or a 25.5% relative increase with a large effect size of 2.49. Cross-sectional area increased by 0.73 centimeters squared or a 37.3% relative increase, but with a smaller effect size of 1.2. So while CSA showed a larger percentage increase, muscle thickness showed a stronger and more consistent change. In fact, 32 out of 34 participants had muscle thickness changes that exceeded the minimum detectable difference, whereas only 15 out of 34 participants showed meaningful changes in CSA. This suggests that muscle thickness may be more sensitive to small or short-term changes in muscle size. Now for the data geeks out there, the authors also ran a correlation analysis 
analysis to see if changes in muscle thickness aligned with changes in CSA. The correlation coefficient was 0.33 with a p-value of 0.05, which is just above the usual threshold for statistical significance. This means that there was a weak to moderate positive relationship, but it wasn't strong enough to conclude that changes in one reliably predict changes in the other. So what does this all mean? Well, this study gives us a few key insights. First, muscle thickness appears to be more consistent and sensitive in detecting short-term changes, possibly because it's simpler to measure and less affected by small shifts in imaging angle or probe pressure. CSA, on the other hand, while useful, showed more variability and was harder to measure precisely. More importantly, this study shows that a percentage change in one metric doesn't translate directly to the other. A 10% increase in thickness isn't necessarily better or worse than a 20% increase in CSA. They're just measuring different aspects of muscle morphology. Now, this brings us to a very real world example. Recently, I heard some scientists and science influencers on a podcast say that a 0.71 centimeter increase in the quads, as seen in some of the volume research, isn't that crazy. And to make their point, they pointed out that some researchers observed changes in muscle size of over 47%. The problem here is that the hosts were attempting to make point that a 13.7% change in quadricep muscle thickness is not unusual because another study had observed a 47% increase in estimated tricep CSA. The problem here is the hosts were attempting to make the point that a 13.7% change in quadricep muscle thickness is not unusual because another study had observed a 47% increase in estimated tricep CSA. In the tricep study, muscle size was estimated from muscle thickness measures multiplied by arm circumference, and this is extremely problematic. How does a 47% increase in estimated CSA of the triceps compare to a 13% increase of the quadricep muscle thickness? It is possible that both changes are unusually high when considering the context of other research that has measured muscles in a similar way. And maybe we can't directly compare changes in different muscles measured in different ways, or even the same muscle measured in different ways. This is why we need to be cautious when comparing muscle data across studies. I see this happening far too often, even with PhDs who claim to be world-leading experts. If you want to talk about relative changes in muscle size, it's most appropriate to compare studies that measured the same muscle using the same measurement tools in the same population. Otherwise, you're comparing apples to oranges, or even worse, apples to bowling balls. Different studies use different tools muscle thickness with ultrasound, CSA via ultrasound or MRI, muscle volume using 3D imaging, or estimations using circumferences and equations. Each method comes with different levels of sensitivity, precision, and measurement error. So if somebody says this program led to a 13% increase and that one led to a 47% increase, we really need to ask were they measuring the same muscle and were they measuring using the same methods? And unless the answer is yes, those comparisons may not be valid. This study is a great reminder that how we measure muscle matters, and it matters a lot. The tools we use shape not just what we see, but how we interpret and then communicate these results. Whether you're a coach, a researcher, or someone just trying to understand their own data, it's critical to consider the method behind the metric. So thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel for more evidence-based breakdowns and feel free to leave me a comment. What do you think is the most misunderstood part of muscle growth research? I would love to hear your thoughts. Now, finally, for more details about my one-on-one -on -one coaching, my evidence-based workout at Be A Fit, or my educational books and research review, please take a look at the links in the description below and I'll catch you in my next video.